2022 and now 2023 have been rough years for AAA game release quality on PC, with many games releasing in unfinished and broken states. Some titles like The Last of Us Part 1 that I recently covered again have had core fixes come within a matter of weeks. So it has made me wonder how long does it actually take to fix a PC game? In this video I will return to four different PC titles to give an update on how they have changed since launch. Callisto Protocol, Returnal, Dead Space, and Forspoken. Are they better optimized than at launch? Is everything fixed? Let's find out and first start with a title from 2022 and that is Callisto Protocol. As we know from our initial post-launch coverage, the mind-bendingly awful shader compilation stutter that Callisto protocol launched with was primarily cleaned up within a few patches. Playing the game now, all instances of shader compilation stutter in the game's intro section and beyond should be cleaned up as there's no stutter associated with new effects coming on screen and the game has a lengthy shader pre-compilation sequence with a dedicated UI telling you what is happening. But that was not the only issue at launch and unfortunately other issues from launch still are maintained there in the current version of the game as of this video. One of the biggest issues is the graphical options. First of all, graphical options cannot be changed in real time while you are playing the game. If you go to the visual options menu while the game is loaded, you can literally only change the resolution, not even vSync. This makes tweaking the game essentially impossible for the average user. But even if you want to try and tweak the game's graphical options while the game is not loaded, the menu itself is poorly designed. It's overly nested, which makes navigating the menu a chore where each type of graphical effect has its own submenu. I'm not sure why this was done at all. At the same time, the settings lack good descriptions or visual previews, so you have no good sense as to what the visual and performance ramifications are when you are tweaking. Your only recompense here is in the benchmark, which is indicative of GPU load in the game for sure, but it's not a good way to judge visual changes of settings. So unless you have an eidetic memory or make recordings like we do at DF, there's just not a good way to change settings in this game and get a sense of what they do. The settings themselves are also not too great. Just like at launch, you only have access to FSR2 here with no DLSS or XESS, even though it is a UE4 title and UE4 has easy to implement plugins for both DLSS and XESS. There's no good reason why this game should not support DLSS or XESS. In terms of performance, the biggest issue at launch was CPU performance, where only the strongest CPUs could manage to play the game well at its highest settings. This is somewhat improved now. In like-for-like -like scenarios, I can measure a 12-14% to 14 performance increase on a Ryzen 5 3600 when the game is maxed out with RT on. This is a good improvement to performance, but it is still not enough, of course, to make ray tracing a viable option on a mid-range CPU unless you're fine with 30 or 40 FPS capping. But thanks to those improvements in CPU, CPU performance now a mid-range CPU like the Ryzen 5 3600 can comfortably play the game without ray tracing on and will consistently manage 60 FPS which was really not possible under the game's launch version due to its more depressed CPU performance. Still I would say CPU performance is not actually that great and specifically in two areas. For one, the performance we are seeing here in Callisto Protocol is because the game is not well utilizing the resources given to it. This happens in many UE4 games. On a Core i9-12900K, the game performs essentially the same when running on 6P cores only, 8P cores only, or with the full 12900K enabled. The performance only dips meaningfully when only 4 cores are available to the game. This means Callisto Protocol is very single thread limited, hence why the game shows such linear scaling between the Ryzen 5 3600 and the Core i9-12900K. We're only seeing this much scaling between these CPUs even though there are so many more cores and threads on that 12900K. So this game basically just cares about single core speed. The other CPU issue that we can see still in the game is that there are loading stutters when you get to new areas. With ray tracing on, these stutters can be rather large and distracting when they occur on low-end processors like the Ryzen 5 3600. On larger CPUs like the 12900K, they can still be large but are lessened in their stutter length in comparison. With RT off though, it is a somewhat different story with the loading stutters being kept more in check and as like I said earlier, the game is now actually rather decent with RT off on mid-range PC CPUs. I would definitely not have said that at launch and I would say Callisto Protocol has been moderately improved here and is recommendable enough now on mid-range CPU systems. I say this in spite of the awful settings menu, in spite of the single thread CPU limitations, and in spite of the occasional stutter that you will definitely see while traversing the game world. At least it 
it does not stutter as frequently as the Dead Space remake. Speaking of which, the Dead Space remake on PC is still stuttering and has scarcely been updated since my video review. It received one patch of any note on February 17th and has since been left untouched unfortunately. The game still has its biggest issue. The game is still stuttering incessantly when you traverse the game world on any CPU out there. Yes, it is technically worse on lower end CPUs, but it is still just as visible and as distracting on CPUs that are high end like the 12900K. I'm flabbergasted that there's been zero patching done to help address this issue. The game also still has issues with minor shader compilation stutter that it had at launch. Yes, there is a lengthy shader pre-compilation sequence, but it does not seem to pre-cache all shaders. For example, here in this cutscene, the first time I play the cutscene as we're seeing here, there's a large stutter when I manually start the cutscene by pressing the button panel. Around a 220 millisecond stutter. The second time I play that cutscene, the frame time spike is much smaller. This game just always has a minor stutter when you start a cutscene. But the reason why that stutter is now smaller the second time I play the scene is because the shader compilation is no longer occurring right when the cutscene starts. I can fully prove that it is an issue of shader compilation by reinstalling the driver and deleting all shader caches. And when I do that, as we're seeing in a third playthrough here, the 220 millisecond length stutter happens again just like it did when I played the game for the first time. This occasional shader compilation stutter, when combined with the fact that the cutscenes always seem to stutter a bit, when further combined with the traversal stutter, make Dead Space Remake feel really jittery on PC and unfinished, and it has still not been fixed at all. The whole story is not bad though, thankfully, as the February 17th patch did appear to fix one thing. Essentially back at launch I could reliably cause the game to overflow memory on cards like the RTX 3080. For example, in that cutscene I showed off earlier, at launch, at 4K balanced and optimized settings with ray tracing on, I could reproducibly cause the game to overflow memory and reduce the game to a crawl, running at near single digits in frame rate during that cutscene. It was awful when it would occur, and I could make it occur 50% of the time while playing this specific cutscene. Many people would experience this behavior at various moments in the game on 8 or 10 GB GPUs at higher resolutions. As of the current patch, I could no longer reproduce this behavior, even after I ran this cutscene 10 times. So it would seem this issue is fixed. Other than that though, Dead Space is the exact same as it has been before. It's just as stuttery, which is an awful shame, as this game will stay this way in perpetuity until they do patch it. If they do not, PC users will essentially have to wait until we have CPUs and memory subsystems that are magnitudes more powerful to reduce those massive frame time spikes into something that is not noticeable at 60 FPS. Moving on to the third title here, I wanted to take a look back at Returnal. Now, Returnal did not have nearly as many pressing issues as Dead Space or Callisto Protocol, but it definitely had some issues. For one, the game launched without FSR 2, which I felt was a missed opportunity for those with AMD GPUs. Thankfully now, as of the current patch, FSR 2 and even XESS are in the game. The quality though is not exactly great. When we compare the techniques, we can see that both FSR2 and XESS fail to reconstruct particles very well, but in different manners. In this scene here, there's a lot of rain falling, but only DLSS really shows that rain in the view in a good way. Both XESS and FSR2 should be showing the rain, but it kind of disappears in the reconstruction, with XESS, for example, nearly erasing the existence of the rain entirely. Secondly, we can see how the stability of the image and ghosting are noticeably negatively affected with FSR2 or XESS. With XESS, these Firefly particles in the background have noticeable ghosting on them, even when testing this on an Intel Arc GPU, as you're seeing here. In FSR2, the issue with the particles is that they don't ghost so much, but they alias a lot. Look at the background flickering and aliasing in the FSR2 view on this gate and door in the background. There's a lot of flickering there on the lines. To show you what I mean more clearly, take a look at the shot of FSR2 versus DLSS. Pay attention to the lit rain particles around those alien plants. With FSR2, the image in those areas is flickering and aliasing intensely, which does not happen with DLSS. If we pause the frame, we can see why. The FSR2 particles have hard edges and look like dots almost, while the particle rain is smooth and anti-aliased on DLSS. So it is nice that we have FSR2 and XDSS right now, but their quality isn't so awesome. But not everything's great with DLSS, as DLSS has actually gotten worse as of the latest patches. In the original version, as we can see on the left, 
the depth of field renders correctly with DLSS on. With the latest patch version on the right, we can see that the depth of field renders incorrectly with things not being blurred when they should be, and those things that are blurred are now flickering intensely. This is a shame to see such a regression occurring in the game, and it might have happened when the team implemented DLSS 3, which yes you have access to now and is a great utility item, but more on that in a minute, as I first want to talk about the largest unchanged issue that the game has. At launch I commented how performance on mid-range CPUs was not too great, with random stutters that could occur even as you entered combat at times, which would definitely get in the way of good gameplay. As of the latest patch, this seems largely unchanged unfortunately, even though patch notes have called out fixes for this in the past. Running around the levels, I can still induce frame time spikes just like at launch when I traverse the terrain and open and load new areas. This happens on PlayStation 5 as well, but I can also still see larger frame time spikes that occur just as combat is starting or in the middle of combat. This happens in the current version just like it happened in the launch version. In fact, the very first time I played this new patch on this mid-range PC, the first combat I saw literally had those exact same stutters that I criticized at launch at my optimized settings on a Ryzen 5 3600. So I don't see a great improvement in this area. Similar to this, on March 9th, patch notes have mentioned lessening stuttering with ray tracing on. In my playthrough, this seems to be the case in general, but I still found a number of large spikes in frame time when playing with RT on on the 12900K. Spikes above 50 milliseconds at a time, and one coincided with the change in the level environment, as we see here, which makes me wonder if we still have some missed edge cases with their PSO pre-compilation. Other than that, I saw the same traversal stutter issues that I saw at launch, even on the 1200K. So I would say there's only been a minimal improvement to the game's stuttering situation since launch. It's better with RT on now, but it's still not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Now to help combat stutter to a degree, you can utilize DLSS 3 frame generation, which works pretty well and is visually excellent I would say in this title. I definitely would recommend using it if you can. It does not help eliminate stutter at all, don't get me wrong here, that is impossible. But what it does technically do is lower the CPU load when trying to achieve higher frame rates. For example, if you want to try and run the game at 120 FPS, the real CPU load of that 120 FPS with frame generation on is 60 FPS. As a result of this, you will technically see less uneven frame times than you would see at a real 120 FPS. It's a small thing in the end though, and you definitely can still notice larger frame time issues when using DLSS 3, especially on a mid-range CPU like we see here with a Ryzen 5 3600 being paired with a RTX 4070, and yes, we can still see some frame time spikes there on the frame time graph, even though DLSS 3 is on. Overall, I would say Returnal has improved in some areas since launch, but the core issue of traversal stutter still remain and I find the regression in DLSS quality a real downer. With that being said, we've arrived at my last game in the video here and that is Forspoken. With Forspoken, there were a number of issues at launch, but the biggest was the quality of textures on 8GB GPUs. Set at the developer recommended standard setting, even at 1080p and even with DLSS, textures would never load to a higher quality level. No matter how long you stood at an area, the textures would stay the same ultra low resolution, which was bafflingly low for 8GB of VRAM. I can gladly say as of the latest patch that the texture quality at the exact same standard setting looks much improved on every surface you can find. Like we can see here with this egregious fountain example. The game is now consuming around 300 megabytes less VRAM in this scene here while having much higher texture quality. There are not great hints as to how this was achieved in the patch notes, but I imagine there was some bug in the original streamer perhaps causing it, or the texture streamer was originally poorly configured. Either way, in the new patch, the game has much higher quality textures on 8GB GPUs in the same areas. Still, the game is not exactly perfect though with 8GB GPUs. For one, the textures that are present on 8GB GPUs are of course lower quality than the textures found at the same settings on GPUs with more VRAM. If you have a GPU with 8GB like we see here with the RTX 3070, changing texture quality settings will not change the output resolution of the textures between standard high or ultra high. If you have a GPU with more memory like the RTX 2080 Ti, which has 11 gigabytes of VRAM, then textures set to high will offer up a better quality like we can see on this rock here. So if you compare the two, you can see that textures on an 8 gigabyte GPU on the same settings are lower quality than those at those same settings on a GPU with more VRAM. 
but of course they are still light years better than what we saw at launch. Another limitation for 8GB GPUs is that some environmental textures will take some time to stream in after you rapidly move around the game world. For example, here when I run down this canyon, take a look at what happens when I stop and look at this one rock. It has a low resolution texture on it, much like we would have seen at launch, but it at least now fades into a higher resolution one over time. This does not happen for every texture in the game, of course, but you will definitely notice it happening when you run around the game scene if you set the textures to standard. If you do the same test on a GPU with more VRAM, like the RTX 2080 Ti, it will not have that same texture load in at the same conditions and same settings. There are some ways to help this though with an 8GB GPU. Even though those texture settings between standard and ultra high do not increase texture quality visibly, on an 8GB GPU this setting will still affect the texture streaming speed interestingly enough. At the high and ultra texture settings on an 8GB GPU, you'll see a minimal amount of VRAM consumption going up but textures will stream in more quickly like we can see here. Standard is on the far left, high is in the middle, and ultra high is on the far right. Notice how the texture of the rock streams in more quickly when set to ultra high and high than it does on standard. When checking the performance difference between these settings here, I couldn't really find one, although I cannot say for certain, of course, as that would require playing the full game, and there's just no time for that. Either way, textures now are much better and for spoken on 8GB GPUs, and you have some leeway with the settings to reduce visible streaming without an easily found performance impact. Do I think the textures could still be a bit better? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the game, when running at 1440p DLSS balance mode and RTX 3070, was still maxing out around 6.7 gigabytes of VRAM used while playing the game with RT off and otherwise max settings. That means they're leaving around 1.3 gigabytes or so of VRAM on the table here. So maybe they are being a bit conservative, actually, in the amount of VRAM that they're handling in this game. Perhaps that could be bumped up a bit still to allow for less texture streaming to occur. But still, I would say this is a great upgrade and I'm happy to see it happening. Another change from release is that there have been CPU optimizations in Forspoken. In the original release, the game would be very CPU heavy, running along this path here in the town square. For example, on the Ryzen 5 3600, saw it being in the 40s with RT on and just barely above 60 FPS with RT off. So mid-range CPUs would have had trouble getting a great 60 FPS in this game. Now with RT on, even in that same area, the frame rate is higher than it was previously with RT off in the launch version. So that means we're seeing a near 35% performance increase on the CPU here in like-for-like -like settings in the same scene. If you look at the frame times though there on the bottom right on the frame time graph, you can see that the frame times are not too great with RT on on a mid-range CPU like the Ryzen 5 3600. So I still recommend turning off ray tracing when looking for good stable 60 FPS experiences on mid-range CPUs here. Beyond that, there have also been some other things patched up. XESS, for example, no longer has incessant flickering on its edges and in depth of field when turned on, making it look a lot more usable and stable than it did at launch. Likewise, XESS and DLSS have lessened sparkling that occurs on specular surfaces like the ground here when motion blur is set to on. So XESS and DLSS in this game are both improved now. And lastly, the game has implemented a new screen space and an occlusion technique. At launch, the only option was AMD Fidelity FX CACAO, which really did not look too great in this title. As we can see in this alleyway shot, the SSAO technique just looked like an outline shader. It would insert black lines into those areas where geometry meets, but did not really look anything like real ambient shadowing can plausibly look like. The new technique added in is just called standard, and it appears to be the one that was used in Final Fantasy XV. As we can see in this alleyway shot, it does a lot to make the scene look more natural than the previous fidelity effects technique. So the game now looks better if you use the standard SSAO technique. The fidelity effects technique is still in the game and you can toggle between them, but I don't think there's a good reason to use the fidelity effects one as the new technique costs roughly the same and I think it looks better in every single scene that I've seen it in. It is still a screen space technique of course and is prone to those type of errors, but it does a lot to make this game look better. Altogether, based on my reporting here, I would say Forspoken is the most improved title covered in this video. It went from unreasonably unfinished at launch to competent and recommendable, so this is great to see. With Forspoken being covered, I've now reached the end of this video. With nearly a half a year between these releases and June, we've seen various degrees of improvement in these titles. Dead Space is much the same, and still rather flawed I would say, 
Returnal is in some ways better, but in some other ways a little bit worse. Callisto is improved, but still has a very flawed foundation. And Forspoken is now actually a really good port, I would say, and I would definitely recommend playing it. This diversity of results shows us that time does not heal all wounds in the PC port space. Instead, a game needs a dedicated developer with the right priorities making the right changes. And with that being said, we're at the end of this video. If you did like this update video here, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out, support us on Patreon to get years of our content in high quality for download. Other than that, comment below, follow on Twitter. As always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.